Um, this was actually not a very um, easy lecture to put together. First of all, I've got about 15 years worth of material I want to talk about, but also more importantly, I want to address this audience so that you have something to take home with you, that it, it makes sense. I don't want to just throw a bunch of scientific data at you and go, oh, I guess he's right, but I don't understand any of it, but he's a scientist, so I guess he knows what he's doing, which is we know is all crap anyway, because most scientists don't always know what they're doing. I'm trying to give you some, hopefully some take home lessons, some, some things that you can talk to about with your, your, your caregivers, talk to other patients, talk to your physical therapist. Okay. And I'll just turn this off or we'll just let the, let the airplanes pass. It's okay, it's like, it's like working in a MASH unit, so. And things to talk to your physical therapist, things to talk to to your, your, your physicians that take care of you. And, and a lot of the stuff that I talk about is quite, it's actually, to me it's a very common sense now. I've been working with this for about 20 years. But in fact, in terms of, of the field, neurologists and, and, and clinicians knowing this is actually very, 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 very rare. And so I think we're in the midst of a very different, a big shift in the, a what we call a paradigm shift in, in our understanding of Parkinson's disease and some of the new treatments. So what I'm going to try to do is to, tr is to show you what I think is, it's not a cure. I'm not, I'm not here to cure Parkinson's disease. I want to, I'm trying to, but I think it reveals a new understanding of Parkinson's and also what you can do in terms of treating your disorder, but also what the whole caregiver can do. And also as a young individual who has a brain that they want to take care of, there's a lot of impact in what, what we do in the lab that I think directs that and addresses that uh, uh, directly. Most people end their talks by saying thank you. I'm gonna start my talk by saying thank you and because I don't wanna forget everybody, but I work as part of a large, large team. And this team, and this is just some of the team, and the team is really, the other co-leader is really Giselle Petzinger, who some of you may have heard here last year, and uh, she's not available this year. She's not actually at Mount Everest right now and teaching in Nepal at a rehabilitation facility about Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and, and brain repair and plasticity and the other side of the world. And so, um, so she's in, involved in that. Um, some of you have the opportunity to go see, we have a poster up. We have some outstanding students. Natalie, Will, and, and Vivek are here. And we have a poster. You can talk to them in, in some more detail. I'll go over there and hang out afterwards if you have some specific questions. We also have two articles in the most recent Parkinsonian.org magazine that you might want to take a look at, and it's got, it's got some additional, additional details in there. So hopefully, the one, that's on the one that's underneath your butt. Yeah. So those of you who feel uncomfortable because you're sitting on something, you are sitting on something, okay? So what I want to do today, and I'm, you know, some of it will be a little bit fast, but some of it we'll talk about in more detail a bit later, and you can have the opportunity maybe to, we can discuss it. But I really want to talk about a little bit about what is exercise, and I don't want you to tell me that exercise is good for you. I don't have to tell you that. And that's not what I study. I study the underlying mechanisms of exercise. I want to know why exercise is good, but I do know it's good for everything and everybody, and we should all be doing lots of it, and that's just the bottom line. But that's not what we study. We are more interested in the fact that exercise is a learning modality. We want to know what is it about exercise that actually changes your brain. And this is, this is not trivial, this is not obvious, but in fact, it's a very, very important avenue for our understanding of Parkinson's. The other thing I want to emphasize is the fact that we're interested in the, we are interested in the circuitry of the brain. The brain is not just a simple collection of cells that just does whatever it wants. In fact, it has some very, very specific connections. And some of these connections are very important for motor control and cognitive control. And what I want to do is to show you, in fact, how those, those are, are playing an important role. And then, importantly, how these circuits can be altered by exercise. What is it that we can do to alter and impact the circuitry within our brain? And what are the key ingredients of exercise that can lead to what we call experience-dependent neuroplasticity? The experience that your brain goes through influences and changes the structure of your brain, which is what we call plasticity. And I want to show you some of that. So I'm going to throw some data at you just to convince you that I'm not BSing you. They actually have data for it. We can alter the progression of Parkinson's disease. I don't know, but I do know from the, judging from the guys that I run the LA Marathon with who've had Parkinson's for 35 years and beat me by two hours, that I think that there's some impact of exercise on the Parkinson's brain. And so we really want to understand that in, in more detail. And then a little bit about what some of our current research questions are and why 
why we need lots of money to actually do these experiments. So, like I said, we all know exercise is good for you. I want to know why is it good for you? What's the underlying mechanism? What makes it do its thing? What is about exercise that we can exploit to improve the symptoms of Parkinson's disease? And could exercise modis modify the progression of Parkinson's disease? So these are, these are fundamentally important questions. First of all, what is exercise? Exercise is an activity requiring physical effort carried out to sustain or improve health and fitness. It's really what we're basically defining, just in terms of exercise. But more importantly, what we're thinking about, and actually this comes from a, a lot of the thinking and work from Giselle in terms of uh, trying to understand what exercise is, and she kind of stumbled upon this with a lot, a lot of work, is the fact that she believes that exercise is another form of learning. And <clears throat> but that is actually a very, very novel way of thinking of Parkinson's disease. So what do we mean by learning? So we do know that exercise involves learning of a new skill. And so at any stage of our lives, we can learn a new skill. Who here plays tennis? OK. Or used to play tennis. You, used to, uh, you can go back and play. You can go back and play tennis. You learned it probably as a child. But you weren't very good at it the first. You had to learn and learn and, and practice and go through. This is, this is me when I play tennis. Um, I, I had to pra you know, practice quite a bit in order to do that. But one thing that's very important and that we begin to understand is that this is a new skill. That in fact, this is a very, very important series of events. It's not just, spo it's not just spontaneous. It doesn't just happen. You have to ha get reinforced. You have to focus on it. You have to think about it. And you have to practice, 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 understand your mistakes, and in fact, make it part of your brain circuitry. And eventually, it should become almost automatic. So when I play, it's almost automatic to make a return. Actually, I don't even play tennis, but that's, that's not for you. So cognitive engagement is very, very important. What do we mean by cognitive engagement? You really have to focus. Cognitive engagement and focus are essential for motor skill learning. This is not a good paradigm to learn tennis. You will not be able to focus. Your brain will not be engaged on the skill that you are trying to, ma to master. Okay, so this is very, very important. You're not thinking, well, I was going to say that as a joke about thinking about balls, but we're not going to go there, okay? So, but you can certainly understand the fact that you are not focused on the, the event. And I'm going to show you that from animal studies and human studies, this is a fundamental and extremely important aspect of what we're trying to understand. So motor skill learning with cognitive engagement leads to the strengthening of brain circuits. By learning a new skill and thinking about it, these experiences can become new circuits within your brain. You do this as a newborn. When you are born, you go through this. This is what we term neuroplasticity. Plasticity is really change, the able to, to, to manipulate, and we're basically just manipulating and changing the brain. What do these brains have in common? Adam and Eve, the, the guy from uh, um, 2001, or this, this child going from crawling to walking. We do know that these individuals are all going through new experiences. They are learning. They are, in fact, taking these experiences and making new brain circuits. This is not a new idea. So when you go home and talk to anybody, you say, oh, Dr. Jackwick had these great ideas, and I think he's got these new ideas. This is not new. This is actually a very, very old idea. The idea that experience-dependent neuroplasticity, that the brain changes in response to its environment, response to its experience, response to, to exercise, is actually a very, very old phenomena. Unfortunately, from about 1890s onward, we, we, we forgot about it and never really paid attention. And now it's being rediscovered, and it's something that we've really focused on. So when we think of Parkinson's disease, we have to think more in the big picture. We can't simply just look at Parkinson's disease, and here's our normal brain, and here's our Parkinson's brain, and think of the loss of dopaminergic neurons within the substantia nigra pars compacta leads to the, the depletion of striatal dopamine and its delivery within the basal ganglia. That's 99% of what neurologists think that Parkinson's disease is. It's much more than that. It's not just simply this one interconnection and one transmitter. If it was, putting back dopamine with Cinemet would cure everything. And obviously, it's not the cure. It's great for the symptomatic treatment, but it doesn't lead to the cure. This is a little bit more complex picture. This is a little, little bit more in what we think of, of Parkinson's disease. And I don't need you to memorize this. There'll be no quiz at the end of today's lecture. There'll be an online quiz, I think, but we won't go and get into that. But this is really a disease of the circuits of the brain. And even though we think about the brain stem going into the, into the regions that of, the, of the basal ganglia as dopaminergic, that's where the dopamine is, 
There are a lot of other circuits that are extremely important. And one of the most fundamentally important circuits is the fact that we have these circuits going from the cortex into the basal ganglia, making connections with all these other circuits that are part of the neuron, part of, of the control of the motor aspect of our brain. So you certainly can see that there is a reason we have all this folded stuff that's on top of our skull, inside of our skull. This is actually very, very important for controlling motor, motor behavior. And this is where the thinking parts. Now, what's important is that we don't always want to be thinking about everything that we do. So when you learn a new skill, whether it be tennis or walking, you don't think about that. It becomes an automatic movement. It becomes what we call a, a, a behavior of, of automaticity. So in fact, it becomes automatic. You don't have to think about it. It's always, always gonna happen. However, if there's a breakdown in this circuit, a breakdown in the cognitive inputs into the motor circuit, we lose that automaticity. So patients with Parkinson's disease be, have to begin to think about everything. You think about every step. You think about leaving from one room to another. You think about going up, upstairs. And so consequently, you've lost the, act, the automatic aspects of your brain. What we'd like to do is to put back that automaticity. We want to retrain the brain. And we want to, in fact, find a way that we can get those circuits to, to, to uh, operate again and make those types of motor movements that you used to have become automatic again. And that's really the goal of, uh, of our work. There has been somewhat of a history of exercise in Parkinson's disease, and we know it's good for you. We know there's been epidemiological studies that have shown that people that exercise throughout lifetime are protected against Parkinson's disease. They're protected against Alzheimer's disease, a lot of disorders. This is, this is not uncommon. The question is, we don't know why this is true. What is it about physical activity and exercise that's responsible for that? This is where the animal models can help us. The reason we study animal models is because it gives us some insight into the underlying molecular mechanisms. So I can begin to tell you why exercise is good for you. And then we can begin to take that information and take it to the clinic. At the same time, we can take things from the clinic and bring it back into the laboratory to test very specific types of, 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 of motor control. And this is really where all of our interest in cognition came from because, first of all, this is not a very bright animal. You can't sit there and say, what are you thinking when you do your motor skills? What do you, how do you feel? And, and do, 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 what, do you, what's, what are your challenges? They tend not to respond very well. And so, but patients do. And so when Giselle was talking to patients and we began to do some studies with patients and looking at how their brain learns, she began to see that the cognitive aspect of the brain is very different in Parkinson's disease, even very, very, very early in the disease, even at a point where patients don't even know that there's a difference. They don't know that there's a, 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 an alteration in their cognitive capacity, their cognitive interactions with their motor system. It doesn't mean it's lacking, it's meaning it's different. And she can actually, we, we actually have evidence to show this. I won't get into that, but we can, we can certainly talk about that. So animal models are very, very important in terms of, of our understanding of what the me underlying mechanisms are. And this is just an example of, of some of our earlier experiments. This is a, these are both Parkinsonian mice. And this Parkinsonian mice has been going through about six weeks of treadmill exercise. So every day he has physical therapy. This guy here, it's been Parkinsonian for the same amount of time, except that obviously his, he hasn't been going through physical therapy. He did not get that prescription to take to go to the physical therapist and to go through intensive physical therapy. And so you can certainly see the difference of this. And one of the things that we found, for example, is in fact that these mice that are, are motorically normal, in fact, are better learners. And so they can go into other challenges and see and, and in fact be better at things. Now you might say, okay, obviously what you've done is you've taken this mouse and your exercise is just simply, simply put more dopamine back in his brain. This is exactly what NIH and this is exactly what neuro neuro neurologists were thinking at the time that we did these experiments in, about 10 years ago. You just made more dopamine, didn't you? Because we know that that's the only thing that's gonna help this animal. So when we went into the brain and we said, okay, is there more dopamine? Is the dopaminergic system just been repaired? Just like you know, physical therapy should just make it work better. So just focus on these two panels here and this panel here. If I took this to a radiologist and I said, show me, identify for me the patient from this brain, and these are rat, um, mice unfortunately, show me the patient that in fact is motorically the best. And you say, oh, obviously this one because he's got all this dark enzyme here that's making dopamine. He must be completely normal. And yeah, you're right, he is completely normal. Now, show me the worst guy here the worst patient, the one that's most Parkinsonian. And he'd say, oh, it's obviously this one because he has the least amount of dopamine in his brain. Piece of cake, no challenge here. 
However, I tell him, this is an animal here that is motorically normal despite still having the features in his brain of being a patient with Parkinson's disease. He has found something that has tweaked his utilization of dopamine. When I sent this to the NIH, they just said, they used one word, actually it's two words, depends on how you write it, <laughs> BS, okay? That's what they said. So we did a whole series of other experiments and we said, okay, let's look at that brain. So when we went inside that brain and we looked at the brain of a Parkinsonian animal versus a Parkinsonian animal who is motorically normal, the, the good little mouse that was running, he has no more dopamine than his friend who is still Parkinsonian. He has not made more dopamine. However, when we go in and look at his brain, and just focus on this is a slice of brain, and we can go in and look at dopamine, evoked, what we call evoked potential, how much dopamine you release. Even though you've got 95% loss of dopamine, you can actually release it a little bit more differently. And we, in fact, found these animals that, at this part of their brain, that, in fact, are able to, what little dopamine they have, can spit out a little bit more dopamine if they exercised. And so these, this coincidentally is the region of the brain that controls motor, motor behavior in the rodent. And so now we have an example of an animal that is motorically normal, but is not using dopamine the same way it did before. It in fact has a new circuit. Is this completely BS? No, it's not completely BS, because we can actually, and this, we have worked with, with the squirrel monkeys, but a friend of mine over at uh, Kansas has done the same type of experiment, except in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a model of stroke. And again, he faced the same idea that this was complete BS because the, the adult brain doesn't do this. If an animal is given a stroke and we can map very specifically the pre-stroke versus the post-stroke, but comparing trained or untrained, comparing patients, this is our patient, that have gone through intensive physical therapy by picking these little treats out of this little ro 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 rotisserie here and, and getting these treats and beginning to use parts of the brain that are damaged, in fact show dramatic changes in the circuitry within their brain. And this is a primate, which is pretty close to us, and some of us this is even closer than we think, depending on who you talk to. But in fact, it's showing that, that the adult brain of a primate, as well as a rodent, is able to change in the context of physical therapy. This animal had to go about 60,000 practices. So it's not trivial, it's not simply just, oh, it's gonna happen overnight. So this guy just sitting in his cage is not going to display these types of changes, but in fact requires a, a long period of time. Now, does it have to be just any type of exercise? No. And in fact, this is work from Daniel Holschneider in our research group, who's shown and asked the question, if I take a rat that's Parkinsonian and another rat that is also Parkinsonian, but I compare just the aerobic kind of exercise on the running wheel, you know, as they put them in the little running wheel inside the cage and the animal just gets on there and gets, you know, happy and just runs around. Compare it to, a, to, to a, a complex running wheel in which the animal has to pay attention to where its feet are being placed. And in fact, you can see the differences here in, in just how much they're able to run. Yes, it takes more effort to run on this type of running wheel because a bunch of rungs are missing, so the animal has to sit there and think about what it's doing, where it's going to put its little palm, and it's going to have to use this as feedback to learn a very challenging task. And so when it does that, and you look at its brain and just focus on this little slice right here. This red and white indicates activity comparing an animal that is skilled, that had that really challenging physical therapy versus one that just had that little aerobic, you know, no big deal physical therapy. And in fact, these parts of the brain light up and these are parts of the brain that control thinking. This is the cognitive part of the brain. So even though you're a stupid little rodent, you had to think about this particular type of, 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 of physical therapy and be completely engaged. So now we have evidence that in fact that the animal is able to use this type of challenge to change the circuits in its brain. Now, <clears throat> where, what exactly is changing inside that brain? This is where our concern is, is at the level of the synapse. We believe the synapse is, at least I believe it, is that the synapse is the center of disease in Parkinson's. It's the center of disease of most human neurological diseases. It's not the death of vast amounts of neurons within the brain. That's something that happens very, very late. It's actually dysfunction at the synapse. What is a synapse? A synapse, and again, there's no test today, okay, so you don't have to worry about this, but all it is is a form of communication between one neuron and the other neuron. Most of us have about four billion neurons in our brain. Some of your spouses will say there's maybe only two. One's for eating, one's for going to the bathroom. Okay, but that's something else. But 
But in fact, these connections are at the level of the synapse. And the synapse really is the form of communication. Now, saying that, do we have any evidence early in disease that in fact the loss of the synapse, the loss of the connection within the brain, underlies the diseases in humans? And yes, we do. And here's for an example. This is an Alzheimer's disease, and this is a neuron in Alzheimer's disease. And you see all these little yellow things here? These are synapses. These are the connections that are made from one neuron to another. And you can certainly compare a normal neuron to an Alzheimer's neuron and in fact see that there are dramatic differences in the connections that that neuron makes. Is there evidence for this in Parkinson's disease? Yes, there is. And in fact, this is the, uh, the, the, the work that comes from William Toy, who is out by our poster. And in fact, he can take animals that are Parkinsonian and he exercises them and asks, with exercise, do I see more synapses? Do I see more connections taking place? Do I see the strengthening and the protection of these commu forms of communication between one neuron and, and another? And just look at this, here's the, here's the example. Here's a, a Parkinsonian neuron. In fact, this is a, a neuron which is found within the basal ganglia, the part of the brain that's responsible for taking in dopamine and using dopamine and connecting with the cortex, connecting with the parts of the brain for, for cognitive thinking. And in fact, this is the center of the, of the motor circuit. And in fact, when you look at one particular cell using a stain, which we call the Golgi stain, very, very old stain invented in 1864 by Dr. Golgi, and in fact, can allows us to look at the structure of, of, these, of these synapses, which we call dendritic spines. So just looking at the, M, the Parkinsonian versus a Parkinsonian with exercise, in fact, we see a dramatic increase in the number and types of connections that these neurons are making. So again, we have evidence of, of these types of connections. This is work from Natalie Kintz, who is also out, going to be out at the poster. And she's interested in one other little thing. We know that, that synapses come together and make connections, but they use very specialized molecules to make those connections alive, to make actually then allows them to communicate. And these are called glutamate receptors, and they're found right in the synapse, and they, 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 they allow calcium to come in and all that signaling and all that, that information. This is how they communicate. And she's able to show it again, just compare these two panels right here. One panel from a Parkinsonian rodent, a lot of, let's call it aberrant, a lot of other receptors are being made that shouldn't really be there. But in fact, with exercise, you have a normalization of these receptors back to what it looks like in a normal animal. So you can actually reverse the aberrant synaptic communication between neurons with exercise. The type of exercise these animals get, an hour a day uh, on a treadmill, running at, at, at a very high speed for about six weeks. They get Saturdays and Sundays off to go to church and things like that. But, but in fact, it's, it's a very, very intense type of research. This is again just uh, more work from Natalie, just showing, okay, I showed you a bunch of proteins that are changing, these forms of communication. Are they making little active connections? And by looking at one specific, specific protein, she can then show that there are these dramatic changes. And so again, the, the communication between, between these neurons is actually changing with exercise. So who cares? Okay, you're a rat, you're a mouse, you're a monkey, we can cure you, who really cares? Okay, that's not, that's not a problem. We care to bring this to, to the patients. Could neuroplasticity serve as a novel target for understanding and treating neurodegenerative disorders? This is the brain that we think of in terms of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and things like that, that pathology, this is what we're up against. However, take in consideration that there's about, probably this person's been living with disease, different types of disease for about 30 or 35 years before they donated it to us. So we're very, very important, it's a very, very important thing to keep in mind. Does lifestyle impact, is there any evidence that lifestyle impacts the progression of disease, your susceptibility to disease? Some of you have heard about the Nunn study, and the Nunn study is actually a study from, from the University of Minnesota that they, they had about 700 nuns who, who uh, participated in this program where they, throughout their lifetime, were able to donate intellectual reflections of their cognitive capacity essays they wrote, letters they wrote, and they were analyzed to look at their intellectual capacity. And then when they passed away, they donated their brains, and pathologists looked at their brains and asked, is there evidence of Alzheimer's disease in a patient or in a person who has high cognitive capacity, who doesn't show that clinically? And remarkably what they showed, and this again, here's some pathology of, of Alzheimer's disease, in fact that, that patients Almost everybody shows some evidence of Alzheimer's disease after a certain age, 85 or so. 
everybody has evidence of it. However, not everybody comes down with the clinical features of Alzheimer's disease. In fact, they seem to be protected against Alzheimer's disease. Could it be because they have a greater a cognitive capacity? That's quite possible. So again, who really gives a, literally, a rat's ass about what we can do in a mouse because we really want to translate this into humans. And this is really, really what we do. And so with Giselle Petzinger and Beth Fisher, they've translated what, we, what we're doing in, 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 the, in, the, in the human. So patients with Parkinson's are, are asked to exercise. We can then look at their brains, and even though this is a mouse brain where you can see these changes that are taking place and how dopamine is used, we can also see that in humans. And in fact, we can see that, that, in, that we can change how dopamine is handled in a patient with Parkinson's disease if they go through intensive treadmill exercise. Eight weeks of intensive exercise, three times a week, running at a very, 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 very fast pace. And in fact, we can see this, this shows us some of these differences that take place. So here's an example. So this is a patient, and I hope you all can see this, but basically we have a patient, typical Parkinson's patient. He's walking with a, 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 a cane, a small shuffle, no hand uh, sway. He comes to a carpet, he's going through a door, he's displaying some aspects of freezing. This is very, something we were all very familiar with. He leaves the door and he wants to then uh, change uh, direction, changes direction by, again, a very, very uh, minute shuffling and something we see that's very, very, very typical. Okay? This is not uncommon to, 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 many, to, to many of us uh, in this room. Very, very common. Same patient, given either we've got the same thing with either intensive treadmill exercise or with what's called the big and I think you'll hear more about the big this is actually and I'll show you why the big works that this this is the, the the same patient and this patient first of all I don't see a cane um, the gait's very different I see arm swing I didn't see any freezing and he's walking out the door and he's looking for his Porsche and his new girlfriend so <laughs> He might have Alzheimer's, so he doesn't know where she is. But, um, but he's, he's certainly, you can certainly see the difference between these two patients. And this is only after a few weeks of intensive physical therapy. Huge, huge impact. And if you ask me which one should displays the greatest quality of life, I think it's a very, very easy thing to see. So what is it about all those things of exercise? Because the most common thing that patients ask is what form of exercise should I do? Because I really like tango because uh, of obvious reasons. I don't like Tai Chi because I don't like the noodles. Um, I don't like boxing, but I really, really like these other things. What should I be doing? And then one thing that, that, that Giselle pointed out that's common in these is that these are all examples of skill-based exercise. Each of these patients, and I'm not sure if she's a patient, but that's up to you. All of these individuals are going through exercise, physical therapy, and they are engaging themselves cognitively at a very, very high level. They are learning a new skill. They have a specific goal that they are trying to achieve. And this is what's very, very important about all these different mod modalities. So it doesn't matter what you do, just do it such that it's building skills, engaging you cognitively, and, and leading to nurse, nurse, new circuits. What does this all mean? The parameters of exercise, and this is extremely important, this is, this is the most important slide today, is the fact that what is it in exercise that leads to changes in the brain? What changes the circuits in the brain? We do know high intensity. It's got to be an intensive form of exercise. It's good to go for a walk, but if you can run, if you can run on a treadmill, it's going to have a much, much greater impact. Long duration, at least an hour at a time, maybe several hours, six to ten hours a week. It has to be complex. You have to pay attention to it. Do not be distracted by your, by, 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 by your shirtless um, uh, tennis instructor. It must be very specific. It must be, be designed to address those parts of the brain that you want to affect. And it must be difficult and challenging. So all together, what is this? This is all just a learning experience. Your brain did this when you were a one-year-old. The brain, we want to find out how you can redo this at this particular age. So this is really a learning experience. And that's what brings together all these different forms of exercise in order to, to actually to, uh, influence it. And so basically, we can go back to this circuit. And we can now appreciate this circuit in a lot more detail because we can look at this with, a, with some new vision and see, yes, 
I am interested in the motor circuit that goes from the brain stem, my substantia nigra, parts compactor, that makes dopamine, that sends axons into the basal ganglia, that then delivers dopamine, which is compromised in Parkinson's disease. However, what I'm hoping that you now have an appreciation of the fact that we have a lot of other circuits which are going to be, which are very, very important in order to enhance the motoric behavior, the loss of the motor circuitry that's found in, 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 the, uh, in, in Parkinson's disease. Are there some other things? Do we know this all? No, there's a couple more things that we really have to address. We really want to understand what is it about experience that influences neurogenesis. We are constantly having new cells born in our brain. We don't know what it is that, that's responsible for integrating them. There's a talk today on stem cells. We want to understand how we can make stem cell transplant work better. Maybe exercise can do it. Maybe this whole aspect of getting it into the circuitry of the brain is going to be what's going to make stem cell transplant successful in terms of, of reestablishing the circuits that are damaged or lost, or to find new circuits. My, um, uh, rodents are able to find new circuits to overcome their motor behavior. The human brain, we believe, can also do the same thing. We have to know what diet is, diet throughout a lifetime. And you certainly can look at these two monkeys, and this guy has been eating at Denny's all his life. This guy has been eating a, a, a very healthy lifestyle. You can see that this is a very happy monkey. This is a very sad monkey, very upset. But when we look at his brain after 25 years of bad diet, we see that this monkey actually shows the, the, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So again, very, very important. And finally, what is it that communicates with the brain? What is it in terms of our immune system, our skeletal muscle, and our fat tissue that allows motor and changes, experiences to come into the brain? And this is actually a very, very active part of our, our research right now. So finally, experience in the form of environmental enrichment, exercise, influences the brain health, provides protection, and modifies disease progression. And this last slide really just kind of addresses all those things that I'm trying to, 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 to show you and is actually part in, included in the article in, in, in uh, Parkinsonian.org that in fact exercise, overall brain health is improved, synaptic strength is improved, leading to improved circuitry and leading to improved, improved behaviors. And so thank you for your time. And one thing I hope that you come away from this is now with a greater understanding of the fact that this exercise that people say we should be doing can actually be important because it can lead to new circuits within the brain, strengthening those circuits that may be compromised, and because of the cognitive engagement, which is extremely important, can help those circuits be to become established. This may not be a cure for Parkinson's disease, however, it may reveal to us some new therapeutic targets that we would like to go after that could in fact be a cure, and in fact that this may represent a very important modality to improve the quality of life of patients and we certainly can see that in patients that do this types of types of, of, of exercise. So thank you for your time and uh, I greatly appreciate your, your interest. So. Yeah, okay. We have a couple minutes to okay, we have some questions. Uh, yeah. are, are there any studies that have been done in San Diego regarding exercise? We are actually as a multi-site we are uh, with UCLA, UC USC, and UC San Diego are have a number of grants in that are 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 um, in, uh, directly involved in this research, and we're hoping to get that supported. So one thing that we can have patients do, if you don't want to write a big check, call your congressman, call your senator, and say why the hell aren't we funding more grants through the NIH? Right now the funding level is about five percent. It's very very challenging, and that means I write 20 grants a year and maybe get one funded. So, but we're trying very hard. There's a lot of sources, and, and the Parkinson's Association in San Diego is playing a major role in helping us actually to identify and, and, and support these types of studies. And so that, that's an extremely important, they are happening. So what I would do is, 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 is maybe get on our, our, our email list or, or whatever, and we can tell you some of, the, some of the studies that are going on. But stay in touch with the PASD. They will make sure that you know exactly what's going on. They do a wonderful job of that. Sir. Go back to the slide that shows you got a good memory. I'm impressed. That's a, that's one, yeah. Okay, you didn't, you didn't want the Playboy one with the. Yeah. I did. I got that. Okay, you got the extra. Okay, good. Okay, make sure. So, yeah. I can also send you the slide set. <laughs> so, any other? Yes. Probably not. 
because you have a lot of, of patients who have a central tremor and never progress to Parkinson's disease. There's been a lot of clinical trials. So when a, a young patient comes in and they have a tremor, Giselle often says, don't worry about it. You're, you're, this is a very common thing. Um, and so that's, that's, that's my understanding of, of, of what, is, what, it, what it is. Um, obviously, it's a resting tremor, very different type of tremor. So different physiology, very different parts of the brain are involved. So 40% of everybody has some kind of tremor. Yeah, very common. Yes? But I used to exercise before I got Now it's difficult to exercise hard like that. How, how would I, you know, I try to... No, I, I agree. It's, yeah, this is why the, 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 the answer from that comes from <laughs> hooking up with a really good physical therapy group. And I know you've got some outstanding people in, in the San Diego area. They can help you because they can look at you, your lifestyle, what your, your physical capabilities are, and engage you. So whether it be body weight supported, would it be in a pool, would it be a number of these other things, they can assist you on that. You have an amazing number of resources in San Diego that we collaborate with. We know some of them are actually trained at USC and have now established um, practices down here that, are, uh, that, that can help you with this. So I would call PASD, take a look at their list, and, and hook in with somebody. And also the support groups um, are, do an excellent job of, you guys went for a 5K walk today, that's a good start. Uh, do it again tomorrow, um, Monday morning. You're laughing, come on, okay. So, uh, then we can go to the beer tent, okay? That's, uh, that won't be there every day. But, exactly. but again, the physical therapist, a neurophysical therapist who knows about the brain will in fact help you in terms of, of this type of thing. So. Can we have one last question yep. over here? Oh, sorry, yep. Does spasmodic dysphonia, could that be a precursor to Parkinson's? You know, that's different. And uh, what I would probably do is, is talk to a specialist on that, like a PD specialist. But there are a lot of things that we, we for example, Parkinson's disease is a, let's call it almost like a syndrome, many different things. You can have one or two things affected and that's not Parkinson's disease. That's very, very different. So, and there are different parts of the brain engaged. There's, there may be different underlying pathophysiology. It could be very different, very different treatments also. This is something that a neurologist trained in movement disorders will tell you very quickly. And I again stress the specialist aspect. A lot of, it's very important that you go to specialists, that you see a movement disorder specialist that fellowship trained because they can tell you and answer these types of things that a common, I wouldn't just call it a common neurologist or g general practitioner may not know at all and may say, well, I read an article and I think this may be a concern. See a specialist and you've got some outstanding specialists in the San Diego area and, for, and they can inform you and help be extremely helpful. They're good because we collaborate with them and I trust them, so yeah. Okay, thank you again for your time. Thank you.